Just making sure it works. You didn't know I knew how to rap. Don't worry, I don't know how to rap. So for Christmas, all I want is a wireless headset. I feel so out of place when I have to hold a mic. I'm sorry that I had broke the other one. So we're talking about exit strategy, and I had brought up a few things to you as we were taking communion, but there are some critical things that I want to talk about before we, we dive into the Word. Um, we have a, a few things that we need to do, a little housekeeping. Um, one of the things I, I, I ask that this family of God uh, keep in prayer is for the Melba Studo family. Um, Karen Melba Studo, uh, her dad had passed away. Um, you know, but it, you know, we've it was it was amazing. You know, I, I was able to to visit with him a couple of times to pray with him, um, to be with the family. Um, but they're also struggling right now because uh, her three brothers are all tested positive, um, and so we want to keep that family in prayer during this time. Um, it's important that we do um, that. God would um, would strengthen them during this time. Um, I want to continue to pray for, um, and I know this has been happening every Monday at our prayer time, but uh, Chris Thomas, uh, her son John, is, is battling stage four cancer uh, of the brain. So we just tell it like it is. Um, but uh, there, he's a miracle child. You know, Chris had, had spoken to me. Um, but she's going to be visiting him, leaving here on the 15th, I believe, um, and especially going to watch the service on the 17th. So we, we want God to do a miraculous thing, amen? You know, we just want God to touch him um, and, and to, to really bring healing into his life. It's, it's, it's just something that I believe God desires in this situation. So we want to continue to pray um, for him. Where, where's my little Hunter? <laughs> Hunter, don't be hiding, man. Get up front here. We also want to pray for him. He, he heard that I wanted to pray for him and anoint him with oil. And he, he was just like, not me. That oil stinks, you know. But we want to anoint him that, that God would be with him. It's okay. See, he's limping now. Take your time. He's a big boy, huh? It may take me a few rounds, but I think I got you, brother. <laughs> you don't think so? <laughs> he forgets I'm a street boy. <laughs> we, we don't fight fair, you know? Come here, buddy. Love, can you grab this for me? All right, this is what God wants. He wants us to anoint you. For special protection and a special anointing. I don't know what it is right now, but I feel in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit that, Lord, I'm not just praying for healing over this body, but I'm praying for a special anointing. Hallelujah. Father, I just lift your Son before your throne of grace right now. And God, I ask you to touch him, Father, from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet, especially in his ankle, that, Lord, you would heal this tendon. But, God, I'm also praying over this spirit. And, God, I'm praying right now in the mighty name of Jesus that, Father, you would set your son apart from this world. That, Father, you would set him apart, Lord, that his light for you may shine in this world. I'm praying for, Lord, a special anointing in his life. Father, I don't know what it is, but you know what it is. And I'm not just going to profess anything and say something foolish. But, Lord, what I will say that, Lord, I pray you give him a double portion of whatever it is. And that may he not run from it, but, Lord, receive everything that you have for his life. 
Now touch your son spiritually, touch him emotionally, touch him physically, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's also, a, there's things to celebrate too, right? You know, we, we have newlyweds in our sanctuary today, Rick and Margie back there. Man, they're, they're, they're married not even a whole day yet. And guess where they wanted to spend their honeymoon? In church. God bless them. Amen. Anyway, praise God. Father, we just come to you now and we ask that you would just guide us in your word, guide us into all truth. Father, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for your great love for us. Father, we thank you for the great sacrifice of sending your son. Now, Father, I, I just pray that today eyes would be open, Lord, that we would understand kingdom mindedness, that we would understand what it is to be separate from this world. Lord, we just lift you up and just ask at this very moment as we have invited you into the sanctuary that, Lord, you would touch each heart here today. Father, there are many people that are struggling within this world, but, Father, we're overcomers of this world through you. Regardless of whatever is thrown at us, Father, we are overcomers. So, Lord, we give you glory and honor and praise and ask that you would just have your way. We ask this in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. So my question is, what is your exit strategy? In other words, how are you figuring to leave this life and end up in the next? I've heard many things from people. You know, you hear people say, well, I'll figure it out when I get there. And wrong answer. All right, the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die in what? Then the judgment. Okay, so that's not the right answer. And some, you know, I've heard the silly things. You know, I, I've dealt with a lot of people in my life, and, you know, some of these people say, listen, I'll deal with St. Peter when I get up to those pearly gates. You know, I even had somebody said, you know, I'll slip something into his hand when I'm up there. And I'm like, are you kidding me? That doesn't work in heaven. It works with your pastor, but it doesn't work in heaven, you know. <laughs> we call them Pentecostal handshakes. Anyway. No, I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. No, I'm not kidding what they call it, but I'm, don't, anyway, forgive me. Just forgive me. Honey, say you're sorry for me. Anyway. You have to know that you are ready to leave this life to go on to the next. And nothing on this earth will get you there. Only Jesus Christ. Now, we talked about Joshua, as I was sharing earlier, that there, there was something key there when Joshua was ready to go into Jericho. Now, just remember, they, they've been walking in the wilderness for 40 years. Uh, they've been having uh, cloud by day, fire by night for their protection over the people, right? We know that manna and quail were coming from heaven, water from the rock, wherever they needed, God was providing. Their clothes never wore out. Can you imagine that? Never wore out. I mean, that was their life for 40 years. That generation finally died out, and Joshua crossed over into the promised land and is ready to take on uh, those that were, were in the, uh, a, a, on the other side in Jericho. They had a big um, Passover together. They circumcised all the men. They were ready to go. Joshua's like, it's about time. Because 40 years earlier, he prophesied that we could take the land. And so he's all fired up to, to finally get this done. And as he's crossing, he's on a mindset. A lot of times we're like that as pastors. And as leaders, we have a mindset. We're ready to hit the mark. When I, when I, when I was going through my, my studies to get my credentials, I'll never forget they had to do a personality profile. 
And mine was like this. That was it. I remember it was like a Z. Zing, zing. And the guy laughed. He started to tell me what that meant. He says, Joe, you're a lion. That's what this is up here. He says, down here is a seal. <laughs> uh, that kind of seal? He goes, yeah. He says, so, so I want you to know, you're going you're gonna, to, as a leader, as a, as a lion, you're going to lead, you're going to have, you're going to hit your mark. And he says, and the seal means you're going to have fun doing it. Not just me, those that are around me. But then he says, the one thing that you got to be concerned about is that when you hit your mark, he says, you're not going to go in there surgically like a guy would do. Like, what do they call those guys? That, the sharpshooters, right? They shoot one bullet and they get He says, when you hit your mark, he says, you're going to go in with a Gatling gun. And I'm like, okay. You know, I said, that sounds pretty good to me. He says, yeah, the problem with the Gatling gun, he says, you're going to shoot people <laughs> along the way that you shouldn't shoot. I'm like, oh. <laughs> And that's our personality, right? That was Joshua's personality. Right then and there, he's ready to go. And then he meets this angel, and he says, you with us or you're against us? He said, no, neither. I'm here to do what the Lord has commanded. Joshua then, in that moment, realized that he was a knucklehead in his thinking. And next thing you know, what did he do? He bowed his face to the ground. In other words, he got on his hands and knees and realized and recognized what a silly statement he just made. Then the angel said to him, now take your sandals off or where you're at is holy ground. So he kicked those babies out and he stayed buried in the carpet. Has anybody been rebuked by the Lord in prayer? Oh, I have. He one day said to me, who do you think you are? And I went, uh-oh. And I know God is a sharpshooter, man. He can hit me with a bolt of lightning, come right through that window, and not anybody in this room would be singed. Just me. You know, and I mean, he's good, you know. And I was buried, and I was repenting and saying, Lord, forgive me. And that's what, that's what Joshua was doing before he, he was told to take his sandals off. He was repenting. He's saying, man, this, I'm using my thinking, and this is when he recognized it is not my will that is to be done, but his and remember, we covered the Lord's Prayer, giving you a recap. As we pray, right, we're praying God's will be done in heaven, right, and bring it to where? Earth. So can you imagine we pray that prayer every day and we're asking God's will in heaven to be done on earth. So we're surrendering our will and we're surrendering our plans to the king. That has to be part of our exit strategy. You can't say, I'll figure it out then. You can't say, well, I'm going to make God serious in my life after I make my millions. You know, once I get the family, once I get the car, once I get the house, once I do all of these things, you know, then I'll make God a priority. You know, once, once the Bills win the Super Bowl, God will be first in my life. I'm sorry if that pinched. So we're asking him in the Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, holy is thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. What? On earth as it is in heaven. Can you imagine? That's Jesus teaching us to pray. Coming from a guy who didn't have a retirement plan, who didn't have a house, who didn't have a wife, I don't care what the world says, who didn't have anything to his name, and the only things that he had that had worth was his garment that was seamless, and what they did on the, on the cross was that the guards, they cast lots for it. Literally, he had nothing when he came into this world, and he left with nothing. Or did he? I love the thief on the cross, right? Two guys, left and right, when Jesus left, remember? One thief said, man, if you're the son of God, I said, command us to get off these crosses right now and let us walk out of here. And the other, the other thief said, shut up, you. He says, we deserve what we're getting, but he is not deserving of what he's getting. And then he said to, to Jesus on the cross, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And what did Jesus say? You will be with me in paradise 
today, Jesus on the cross, on his deathbed, won somebody to the kingdom. See, that's what he wants to take to heaven from this earth, you and I. Nothing else. Jerry, that's his will. Now, shouldn't that be our will? Shouldn't that be our desire? Should we not be laying down our will? Should we not be laying down our plans like Joshua? Joshua was ready to take on that, 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 that kingdom, and he was ready to go in there by whatever means possible. He was ready to leave with the men of valor, but God says, no, 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 no. We're going to change this up, and that's how God is. The earth isn't that way. This world isn't that way, and we have to recognize like we, we started to last week, is that, listen, we're not of this world. We're just passing through. So we learn it's not our will, but it's God's will. It's not our plan. It is his plan. And finally, we have to re re recognize the exit strategy includes we're not taking anything from this planet with us except one thing. And what is that? People, souls. You and I are not of this world. And again, back into the Amplified, John 18 says this, My kingdom is what? Not of this world, nor does it have its origin in this world. And can you imagine, what did Jesus say that he saw? One day he says, I saw the morning star being thrown to the earth from the heavens, right? like a lightning bolt, one-third of the stars with him. So who was thrown to this earth? Satan and the fallen angels. They couldn't be into heaven. They couldn't be there anymore because they've sinned, and they came to this planet. And then Adam and Eve, they gave up their legal right of ownership to this planet, to Satan, when they fell, when they sinned. So Jesus wants nothing to do with this world. And that needs to be our mindset too. The only thing that is important and should be important for you and I are the same things that are important to Jesus. Amen. And that should be in our forefront in our lives. I mean, you know, you may not hear this preached this way. You know, I mean, there are, there are preachers out there. It's all about you. You want God's special life for you. Shh, that's not him. You get me in trouble. I don't know. No, but understand this. It's, it's not about you. And that's what the angel was saying to Joshua. It's not about you. And you got preachers out there that are preaching it's all about you. That's a lie because that is the, the dialogue of the world today. Everything that you hear in the media, in the magazines, in society, in the schools, in the educational system, even in the government, it's all about you. It's not about me. Joshua buried his face, recognized it's not my plan. i got to settle myself. And guess what? That's the same thing you and I need to do. We need to understand it's not about my life, but it's about the plans that God has for my life. This is when everybody starts to take Jeremiah 29, 11 and starts to quote it. It's not about what your plans are. It's what God does through each one of you. And for him to get the glory through those plans. So we see that. And Jesus says, listen. I want to make it clear, my kingdom is not of this world, nor does it have its origins in this world. My kingdom, if, it was my, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting hard to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But it, as it is, my kingdom is not of this world. And we read in James 4.14, right? Uh, 4.4, excuse me. To love this world means that we're in enmity with God. That's a harsh word. It means deep-rooted hatred. 
He even calls us adulterous. Remember that from last week. So we see this metaphor that the, the Bible shows. It shows us married to our Savior, Jesus, right? And this is the thing I like about Jesus. I like about the Father. He says, I'm a jealous God. I'm not sharing you with no one. We see that theme throughout Scripture. To love God or to love money. You can only serve one of two masters. And, I, I, and we know it to be true. If, he is, if we're his bride and he's our bridegroom, he doesn't want to share us with anything, anyone, right? You don't want to share each other with anybody else, right? To each you share, right? When you get married someday, nobody else. Otherwise, forget about it, right? That's how it is. And that needs to be our mindset that Jesus doesn't want to share us with anybody. So he doesn't want to share, have one foot in the world and one foot out of the world. No, he doesn't want that because, listen, that's, that's hot or cold, right? You're either hot or cold, but if you're lukewarm, if you're in the middle, guess what? I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. He's made his will for us very clear. He's told us what the exit strategy is. He says, you need to surrender your will to me. You need to set aside your plans and recognize that you can't love this world. Tell him I'll call him back. John 17. Let me pick up now. In the next few minutes. This is one of the most beautiful things in scripture here. It's a, the high priestly prayer that Jesus is about to pray for the believers. But I want you to hear the theme of his prayer as we go through it. I'll try to go through it quickly so we can, we can truly understand his heart for us. But prior to this, he's, he's, he's told the disciples, I'm getting ready to, to be killed, and they're all mourning. He says, don't worry about it. I got your back. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And, and, you know, there's a lot of grieving at this point. And then Jesus had to get alone, and he had to pray. And he had to pray for those that he loved. And this is his prayer. So go to John 17 with me. says this, and after verse 1, Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and he prayed. He says, Father, the time has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. Did you hear that? We want to do what? Is glorify the Father. Because we're one with Jesus. Let's continue. For you granted him authority over all the people, that he might have e give eternal life to all those who had given, that you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on the earth by completing the work that what you gave me to do. It's not your plan. It's not my plan. But it's his plan for our life. Verse 4, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Can you imagine that? So we see here, glory, the glory of your son, that the son may glorify you. We see that's part of our exit strategy. And what did Jesus say? I have given eternal life to all whom you have given to me. Look at the power in that strategy. He didn't say anything about wealth. He didn't say anything about riches. But what he did say is that I'm here to do 
your will. Amen? This is eternal life that you may know the one true God, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So it's God's will. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. That's the same thing he's asking of us. And many people don't recognize that God has to be 100% vested in your life and you in his. It's not just Sunday. It's more than that. It has to be every day. Just like the Son made it an everyday thing with the Father. Can you see that picture here? For your life, and for mine. Let me continue. As he continues to pray for the Father, he says, I have manifested your name, verse 6, to the people who you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Guess what? We need to keep his word. Not just part of it, but all of it. Not just a piece of it. Not just the things we like. But even the things we don't like. Now, they, verse 7, they know that everything that you have given for me, given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know what? In the truth that I came from you, and, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. Now, listen to this part. I am not praying for the what the world see the separation but for those whom you have given me for they are yours now verse 10 all mine are yours and yours are mine and i am glorified in them verse 11 and i what am no longer in the world but then he says this but they are in the world and I am coming to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as you and I are one. Look at what he's praying right here. He says, Father, they're not leaving this world, but I need you to keep them. Keep them what? Safe, secure, separated, holy. Verse 12, while I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you had given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and listen to what the world says. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Man, that's, that's like a dividing moment right there, right? Especially among young people. It's really difficult to be a young person and serve God for a lot of young people because they come up against greater persecution. I remember one time the kids with their phones were running around school, and it's a powerful story about a young man, and, and they were showing pornography on the screen on their, on, their, on, their, um, on their phones. And this young man, every time they, they would show it and they would put it towards him, this young man would turn his head and wouldn't look at it. And they're like, why? Why are you not looking at it? He says, no, I'm not into that. I don't, I don't look at these things. I'm saving my eyes for my wife. And then they started to really give it to him. What? What? You don't like girls, do you? Oh, you must be gay. It's the kind of stuff and the persecution that people go through, young people go through. That's just one example. It could have been easier for him to what? To just look at it. But that young person took a stand. We need to take a stand, even as adults. We need to be separated. People need to see in us that we are not of this world. Can I tell you something? At times, we need to be hated. Amen. 
hated for the right reasons. The world, verse 14, has hated them because they are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. And then this is it's amazing. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is the truth. That's what keeps us separated. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in the truth. Now, what does sanctified mean? To be set apart for a special use. Oh, that's beautiful. Every one of you have been set apart for a special use use of the Lord. Well, I'm not that special. Yes, you are. You're more than that in the sight of God. He loves you more than you can ever imagine. And he's called each one of us to be separate. And we need to live a life that looks like that. We need a life that we could say, listen, the Lord, take me if that's what you want. And there's no hindrance in that thought because of materialistic things. Are you with me? I know it's warm in here. I feel a few of these. I can see out there. It's okay. My wife was one of them, so don't worry about it. I'm only kidding, sweetie. Sanctification literally means to set apart for a special use or a purpose. That is to make holy or sacred. So sanctification refers to the state or the process of being set apart. It's a process. It just doesn't happen right away. Verse 20. I do not ask for these only. And this is something that you should highlight right here. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through thy word. Do you know who he's talking about here and who he's praying for? Us. He's not just praying for the disciples then, but he's praying for us, his disciples now. That they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world, what? May believe. The only way the world is going to believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior is through you. I want you to hear this is what Jesus is saying. In other words, it's through your life, the way you live it, it's the way you respond, it's your actions, it's your reactions, it's how you advise, it's how you shine your light. Can you, that's, a, that's a high, holy calling. We can't act like the world, we can't respond like the world. And, and, and the world doesn't get it, even the churches do not get it. I remember one time, Joyer, I'm at, I'm at your place with another young man, and and there was a guy in front of us. He was dropping F-bombs left and right. I mean, it was to the point that it brought something out in me. And I put my arm around this guy, and he was a husky kind of big guy. I put my arm around I said, listen, brother, the first thing we're going to do right now is work on the F-words. And he looked at me, and he's like, what? And then the guy I was with it says, hey, you may not know it, but this guy right here is a pastor. The guy turned around and he goes, what? Praise the Lord. He put his arms around me. I'm a, I, I go to church too. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm not going to mention the church. And he started to be so excited to tell me what church he went to. I'm not doing that. But I'm looking at this guy, but he believed it wholeheartedly. 
He, he was so enthusiastic. I mean, no curse words came out of his mouth at that point. But he just started to, to share scripture and to share this. And I'm just like, this is the deception of the world. This is how this, this young man is deceived. And we can't be deceived. There's a great delusion happening right now throughout the world. I, I believe true believers see it. They're not fooled by it. They're not deceived by it. I mean, the, the world is. But we're not. And that's because of the Holy Spirit that lives in us. So let me, let me just wrap this up. So it's through us that the world believes. Then he goes on in verse 22. The glory that you had given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and, them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you have sent me. Can you not see this? It is through you. So when you think of your exit strategy from this life to the next, it's not about the one who has the most toys who wins. It's about the one who serves God wholeheartedly, lives for him, even being persecuted, they don't respond, loves him, loves his word, uh, his word and puts everything in this world aside and serves him and says, Father, let thy will be done. Even Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was sitting there and he's saying, Lord, take this bitter cup from me, but what? Not my will, but thy will be done. Can you not see the mindset that Jesus and his Father have set for you and I to have? And all the enemy is looking to do is to derail you and I with the cares of this life. And the worries that it brings. Verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am. To see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundations of the world. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, he says what? I know you. And we can see that played out right now. The world does not know who Jesus is. And these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make known that the love which you have loved me may be in them, and I, what, am in them. That's our testimony. Can I tell you something? This is pretty deep stuff. Nowhere in that did Jesus say anything about materialistic things. I got one more for you. You may not like this. He doesn't say anything about your happiness. Because what? The joy of the Lord is our strength. He, he doesn't say anywhere in this life that you will be prosperous. As the world sees prosperity. On the contrary, he says, you're going to be hated because of me. You're going to come under persecution because of me. You're going to have to take a stand when no one else is taking a stand because of me. Now, this is a high priestly prayer. And Jesus recognized, as we would read these words, that it would be very difficult for us to execute these things perfectly. But here's the beautiful thing. We read about this prayer, right? And we say, that's great. And he's even praying for those in the future. But I don't know if you recognize Jesus never stopped praying. What does the Bible teach? Where is he right now? He's at the right hand of the Father doing what? Edith sitting, interceding for who? Dude, Jesus is praying for us. And greater is he that is in me than he that is what? Right? I can do all things through what? Christ. 
We can do this. But it has to be the mindset of every believer. That needs to be our exit strategy. That we lay down our own will. That we allow God's will to be done in and through our lives. And to, guess what? Hate the world for what it is. It's an ungodly system. But the people God loves. And that needs to be our mindset. We have to love the people in this world. Why? To take them with us when we leave and we exit this place. Let's all stand together. I want you to ponder about this for a moment. We're going to open these altars for prayer. But before we do that, I want you to do a self-examination. Take a moment before they start to play. I want you to ask yourself, what is your true desire in life? I want you to think about that for a minute. What is your true desire in life? What are your goals? What are your goals? That'll show you where your heart is. And I want you to understand, it, I, 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 I'm not putting down... God's creation, it's, it's beautiful to, to go camping and to enjoy the mountains and the lakes and things of that nature. But what man has created here in our society is, is, is a work of the enemy to only draw you away from God. That's really what this comes down to. The enemy is trying to draw you away from from God with the cares of this life. Well, does that mean, Pastor, I don't, I, don't, <laughs> I don't go to my job? No. You shine the light at your job. Well, does that mean that I just stay hidden in my house and read the Word and just pray and, and never go out? No. You read the Word and you take that good news out to the world to shine your light. That's what Jesus did. He was always out. He was always out and about, and he was saying things to the world that was so contradictory that, that they were ready to throw him off a cliff. I love to be able to share the truth with people, and that's what God is asking us to do. It's not about me. It's about him. So if you have found yourself to be making it more about you than him. I want to be honest with you. You need to repent. You need to ask for forgiveness. If you've made other things in life more important than God, than Jesus, guess what? You're at enmity with God. You're an adulteress, the Bible says. That's what James 4 teaches us. These are powerful words but they're words of truth. There are words of truth that get you and I to heaven when we change our thinking and put our focus back on Jesus. So take a moment. I want you to think about where your heart is and where it's been. Jesus says this. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. Then all these other things shall be added unto you. What does that mean? So then you'll live a life 
that is pleasing to God. You'll live a life that's pleasing to you, that's pleasing to your family, your neighbors, your co-workers. They may not understand it, but that light is going to shine. And then at that moment that gives, God gives you opportunity, you share the love of Jesus with them. So if you've been making it about yourself and not putting God as a central focus in your life, I'm going to ask you to leave your seats and just come up and just ask God to forgive you. Make a commitment to put him first. Thank you. Continue to come.